This child is from Jumadian, Henan. He has had umbilical cord inflammation for three days. He donated blood plasma two times at the First People's Hospital in Jumadian. Everyone take a look. This was taken when he was one and a half years old. This was taken when he was three years old. At this time, he was already in bad shape. But it wasn't known that he had AIDS. He died at four years and one month old. This child was diagnosed with AIDS for only one day. After being diagnosed with AIDS, they asked him to be discharged from the hospital. After being discharged, he said to the nurse, Auntie, please save me. Don't make me leave the hospital. I want to get treatment. He saw the doctor and said, Uncle, please save me. I need to see a doctor. But in the end, the hospital insisted on discharging him. This was the hospital he originally gave blood to. Finally, while his mother held him at home, he passed away at 2 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, while hugging his mother's neck, he said, Mom, please protect me. I don't feel so good. The person you are currently watching tell the tragic stories of children with AIDS in China is named Yao Jie Gao. She passed away at her residence in New York on December 10th at the age of 95. Yao Jie Gao was a gynecologist also very famous in the field of AIDS in China and is generally said to be well known. The international media also refers to her as China's first advocate for those suffering from AIDS due to her years of unrelenting efforts and appeals. The international media finally became aware of the existence of such a large group in China who have been affected by HIV AIDS resulting from selling blood. It is precisely because she accepted media interviews non-stop, conducted on-site investigations, which then ultimately forced the Chinese government to acknowledge this group and provide them with just the most basic medical coverage. It can be said that Yao Jigao's experience, along with the tragedy of the entire Chinese AIDS community, formed a microcosm of an era. This is why people refer to her as the Mother Teresa of China. Today, Let's talk about the story of Yao Jigao. This child is from a village. His name is Dong Dong, and he donated blood when he was five and ended up dead by 15. He died in January 2009. He had abdominal swelling, and when he was critically ill, his father spent all his money. His father then suggested selling the house. He begged his father on his knees. At that time, he was 14 years old. He was kneeling down and saying, Dad, Dad, Please don't sell the house. I won't get better. I won't ever be cured. If you sold the house, our whole family would have nowhere to live. Yao Jigao was born in 1927, and her hometown is Kao County in Shandong province. According to her, the Gao family in Kaoxian, Shandong, was a wealthy family with several hundred acres of land. But she has had to constantly flee throughout her entire life. She was 95 years old this year. In the past century, China uh, experienced various upheavals and political turmoil. She herself has been both a witness and a participant in these events. She said the first time she fled was to escape from the hardships caused by the 8th Root Army. During the Second Sino-Japanese War, they arrived in Chao County, Shandong, and kidnapped her father and second uncle, accusing them of being Japanese collaborators. In fact, Yao Jie Gao said that in reality, the Japanese forces had never even been over there. Saying that they were traitors was definitely baseless. The purpose was simply to target their family's assets. Finally, they poured pepper spray into her uncle's nose and they tortured them. In the end, the Gao family had no choice but to give the 8th Root Army a total of 300,000 silver dollars in order to free themselves of this disaster. Shortly after this, the Japanese really came. So the Nationalist Party's army was fighting against the Japanese army nearby and seeing the chaos of war, they couldn't stay any longer. In the end, the Gao family relocated to Kaifeng in Henan province, seeking refuge with their distant relatives. At first, they set up a small grocery store. Later on, they ended up setting up a mill to sustain their livelihood. During the Chinese Civil War, Yao Jie Gao began attending middle school. At this time, she followed her middle school and ended up all the way in Nanjing, in southern China, where the Chinese government had temporarily relocated during the war. Before leaving, her father also saw her off and said, you go ahead. Now, it's so chaotic and everyone is running around. Only one person can make it out of this. She said that this farewell was their final goodbye. When she returned to Kaifeng, Henan, in the 1950s, her father was no longer with us. After returning to Kaifeng, she soon applied to Henan University and was eventually admitted. She initially applied to the Chinese department, but ended up being admitted to the medical school. There, she studied obstetrics and gynecology. 
After graduating in 1954, she was assigned to Henan Provincial Hospital of Traditional Chinese Medicine. Yao Jiegao was also known for her straightforward personality. So during the process of various political movements after the establishment of Communist China, she had been repeatedly suppressed. She said that during the Cultural Revolution, not only was she persecuted, but also her family. Her own son also suffered as a result of being implicated by her. This planted a seed of lifelong discord between her and her son. She said that there was a case that happened in Kaifeng in the past. Someone found cartoons and slogans in the men's restroom, probably containing phrases like overthrow Mao or similar expressions. This was a big case back in the day. So the special investigation team at that time focused on her son. Her son was only 13 years old at that time. After capturing her son, they repeatedly interrogated him. And then finally, they forced him to try and mimic the handwriting from the crime scene. After he finished writing, it was concluded that it was done by her son. As a result, her son was sentenced to three years of imprisonment. Just imagine a 13-year-old child being sentenced. In order to avoid her son being considered a minor, they even specifically changed her son's age to 15 years old. She said that this experience cast a shadow over her son for his entire life. So she experienced many instances when her son strongly opposed her decisions, probably because he was shaken after the iron fist of this authoritarian regime got a hold of him. The first time Yao Jiegao came into contact with AIDS was in 1996, and she still remembers it to this day. There was a rural woman named Ba Xiuying at that time. She had a continuous high fever with mouth ulcers and spots all over her body, but they couldn't figure out the reason. Finally, because she was eager to find out the cause, she went to the library at the hospital to look up information. She felt that the spot on her body at that time was somewhat similar to those of AIDS patients, so she suggested to the doctor to do an AIDS test. But the attending physician at that time believed it was unnecessary. AIDS was considered a foreign disease located in the United States, and it was believed to be primarily transmitted through sexual contact. Ba Xuying, being a woman from a rural area in Henan, China, how could she possibly contract AIDS? But under her insistence, the doctor finally conducted an HIV test. This test found that Ba Xiu Ying was positive for HIV antibodies, which scared everyone to death. It is said that the next day, they sent over 10 members of the Ba Xiu Ying family, including the elderly and children for testing. And it was found that none of them had AIDS. Ba Xiu Ying passed away on the second or third day after being tested. It is said that before she passed away, she held Dr. Gao's hand and said, Dr. Gao, is there still hope for me? I don't want to die. Yao Jiegao said that she had no way to do anything and could only watch helplessly as this young woman passed away. After she passed away, her husband was very heartbroken. They said at this time that I just didn't see it. Her husband just took a plastic bed sheet and didn't get out of bed anymore. So at home, what kind of situation was it? He slept continuously until he started trying to speak to her. Xu Ying, Xu Ying, I brought you something delicious to eat. I brought the things you like to wear. Can't you say something to me again? At this point, Yao Jiegao realized that there was this kind of a large group of people contracting HIV in Henan, which sparked her curiosity as more and more people kept going to the hospital for medical treatment. She wanted to figure out why were there so many cases of AIDS in such a remote and impoverished area in China. So she started going out to conduct on-site interviews. A shocking secret was soon discovered. In the 1990s, there were many biotech companies in China developing a product that utilized human blood albumin, globulin, and other similar proteins. This product was then used to provide nutrients to patients on IV. But producing it required a large amount of blood plasma, so what did they do? Because China has long been a country lacking in blood supplies, these biotech companies come to these remote and impoverished areas to purchase blood. It is said that there were over 200 extraction sites in one province in Henan at that time. These companies would go to these rural areas to buy blood from the farmers. There were also countless illegal sites. The equipment used back then was also extremely rudimentary. It is said that right in the fields or inside the village, they simply sweep the cow troughs and wash the wooden planks and start drawing blood directly on top of them. There were no testing procedures for HIV or any other infectious diseases. In fact, not only HIV, but also other infectious diseases like hepatitis C were transmitted through cross-contamination. Because back then there was a very dangerous method of extraction. It was called the pure blood plasma extraction method. 
which means that after the person finished giving blood, they use a centrifugal pump to separate out the blood plasma from the red blood cells. After extracting the blood plasma, whatever was left gets injected back into the body of the person who sold the blood. And then these people who collected blood said that they would borrow some blood from you and then immediately give it back. You see, you won't lose anything and you can even make money. How much could you make selling blood exactly? 50 bucks a pop. This was quite a large sum of money for the impoverished local farmers. So many of them were lining up to sell their blood. It is said that some people would sell so much they would feel dizzy. So the local farmers invented a cure. When some felt dizzy, they would have someone lift their feet up and lean their head against the ground. This way, blood would flow to the brain and the dizziness would kind of go away. Yao Jiegao directly told this detail to a writer named Yan Lianke. Yan Lianke later used this to write a novel called Dream of Ding Village, which tells the story of the initial spread of HIV AIDS in rural China and the details of the process of selling blood. In addition to the selling of blood, the transmission of HIV also occurred through blood transfusions. Because back then, these hospitals were indiscriminately administering blood transfusions as long as they could charge more. Yao Jie Gao's investigation revealed this form of malpractice. She discovered that many hospitals in Henan would administer intravenous fluids to children for minor illnesses such as diarrhea or any random small ailment. This child was named Zhou Feng Lin. He was born on October 23, 2004. In August 2005, he was playing on the sofa. He fell and hit his head, causing a big bump. He then went to the First People's Hospital, and they gave him a blood transfusion. Afterward, the hospital received a total of 1,800 yuan. After returning home, the child had been constantly ill. They didn't know it was AIDS. Finally, he developed an oral infection. His mother was afraid that he would be starving, so she tried to breastfeed him, but he bit her. He bit her because his mouth was in so much pain. As a result, his mother also got infected. On June 9, 2006, he passed away. Consider that all the blood was collected from people with AIDS and the hospitals ended up cross-contaminating their blood supply and infecting their own patients. As a result, this disease, which clearly originated in the United States, was slowly spreading in remote rural areas of Henan, China. But AIDS has a long incubation period. Not too many people knew this at the time. In the second half of the 1990s, uh, the symptoms of these patients uh, gradually emerged. And as a result, uh, people began to fall ill one after another. Most people don't know they have it when they first start getting sick. They always feel strange and have a fever. There were no effective treatments, so they started to die in large numbers. Some doctors actually knew about it early on and reported it, but it did not receive much attention. Yao Jiegao said that at the time there was a Chinese scholar named Gui Xi En. He was a doctor from Hubei who went to these rural areas in Henan to collect samples. When he went to collect samples in Wenlu village, uh, it was reported that more than 80 out of 150 samples tested positive for HIV, more than half the population. After he disclosed this information, it also drew a lot of attention, but at that time, the media was not allowed to report on these details. The investigation process was then also fraught with difficulties. So in such a tragic situation, with such a serious social issue that has never received proper attention, Yao Jiegao stepped onto the historical stage and became a key figure. After she retired, she didn't have much to do, so she went to the countryside to investigate on her own, or took journalists to the rural areas of Henan to investigate. And then she used her meager income to help those suffering from AIDS. She said the most striking detail that left the deepest impression on her during the investigation was when she visited a rural village in Henan. At that time, the village had many AIDS patients, with some families affected across the board. She said she walked to that village. Suddenly, a child's voice, full of innocence, came through. Come down, come down. She followed the sound and arrived at a farmer's house. Upon entering the house, a tragic scene unfolded before her eyes. A woman was found hanging next to a child who turned out to be the mother. The child's mother, whose husband also had AIDS, chose to end her life in the midst of despair and hopelessness. The child was only two years old. He didn't know that his mother had passed away. He was grabbing his mother's feet and saying, come down, come down. He was starving as he apparently nibbled on his mother's heel. She said that in fact the child also had AIDS. Not long after, the child also passed away. As you can imagine, after she disclosed this information, it triggered dissatisfaction from the relevant authorities because local leaders in Henan had repeatedly stated, there are no AIDS cases in Henan province and it's impossible, it's all fake. 
vigorously concealing the facts. The first time I discovered I was being monitored was in the winter of 2000. Two young people were wearing green coats, huddling on the motorcycle in the snow. They kept brushing the snow off of them. They were sipping on some water and eating already dried out steam buns. I saw this pitiful sight. I went downstairs, put on my cotton shoes, and wrapped myself in a coat. I said, I cooked a lot of food today. Have a drink? It's so cold, I told them. The two individuals hopped back on their motorcycle and then zoomed off with a vroom. On the third floor, an elderly man with the last name Lee said, he was looking at you. Why are you being so nice when they were watching you? Are you still going to bring them hot food? I asked him, why would they be watching me? He replied, they're afraid of journalists coming to find you and afraid of AIDS patients coming to find you. Many reporters from CCTV and other newspapers sought out Yao Jiegao in Henan, asking her to lead them to the rural areas to conduct various reports. She also mentioned a reporter named Wu Qing. Wu Qing was actually my colleague at China Central Television. At that time, Wu Qing was a host on a program called Charity Action. At China Central Television, he also went to Henan to do some reporting on AIDS with Gao Yaojie. During this process, her reputation gradually grew and attracted the attention of international media. In 2004, the New York Times published a report that initially revealed to the international community the upheaval caused by an extensive blood-selling community in China, which resulted in the spread of HIV-AIDS. Earlier that year, Vice Premier Wu Yi visited Henan to conduct research and met with Yao Jie Gao. During their meeting, she inquired about how to resolve the issue. After meeting with Wu Yi, her personal situation improved slightly. Afterward, Li Keqiang, the then secretary of the Henan Provincial Party Committee, also met with her and discussed with her for some time. So, after 2004, the Chinese government finally began to provide some basic medical care to the HIV AIDS groups who had been selling blood in Henan. There is a village called Wenlu village in Henan. This village, located in Shanghai, Henan, has been regarded as a classic example of China's care for the AIDS community. Premier Wen Jiabao used to visit there during the Lunar New Year. Premier Li Keqiang also visited Wenlu village and conducted inspections. As a result, facilities such as health centers were successively established to provide improved medical conditions for the villagers. However, Yao Jiegao found in an investigation that the local government was also trying every possible way to rip people off at that time. For example, when Wen Jiabao went to that place for the Chinese New Year, he promised to give each villager 10 yuan as a New Year's gift. As a result, although the village had only about 3,000 residents, they reported having 881 more people than that. Why lie? Just so these officials can make off with a couple of bucks. She also said there are many other villages where the disease is actually more severe. But because Wenlu village has become the namesake of the entire epidemic, no one cares about them. She tirelessly conducted research in other villages after a meeting with Vice Premier Wu Yi. She and 15 volunteers went to southern China to investigate as the Chinese Ministry of Health claimed that 90% of HIV AIDS cases in China were transmitted sexually and 9% were transmitted through drug use. Those words imply that people with AIDS are solely responsible for their condition because if you engage in risky behavior and drug use, you are responsible for your own health. And if you break the law, the government is not to blame. But think about it. If all the cases are really from blood cross-contamination, then the local governments as well as the central government would seriously be at fault. Because of their lax supervision, they allowed these illegal blood collection stations to operate without any blood testing procedures. Yao Jiegao sought to refute the Chinese Ministry of Health's statement through her own investigation. So after visiting Henan, I realized that there isn't a single clean spot in all of China. I've been to over a dozen provinces, including Hebei, Anhui, Shanxi, Shanxi, Hunan, Hubei, Yunnan, Guizhou, and Sichuan. The main mode of transmission is selling blood, then using contaminated blood to give blood transfusions. Most people now have been infected by blood transfusions. These investigative reports have come together to form one of the most authentic reflections of the AIDS situation in China. Meanwhile, a large number of foreign media reporters continued to interview her, which brought her a lot of trouble. She mentioned that she often had people following her when she went out. At that time, an American human rights organization wanted to award her, but she couldn't attend. Every year, people kept coming to persuade her to leave Henan, and so on. In 2007, she finally made her first trip to the United States to accept an award. She was able to go to the United States to receive the award. 
because Hillary Clinton explicitly expressed her desire to meet Yao Jiegao uh, during her visit to China at the time. Finally, the Chinese government allowed her to leave. After arriving in the United States, which was her first time traveling abroad, she had her first taste of international media. She was also able to feel the respect the international community had for her and her work. According to her account, an ordinary elderly man from the United States specifically flew to her city and bought a $300 ticket just to meet her and say a few words. The man said, what you have done in the first half of your life is remarkable. Now, you're over 80 years old, he added, leave it to me. I will help you and take care of you in your later years. But she refused at the time and returned to China. He just said, you're getting old, you should enjoy your retirement. My biggest hope is that you can write more books. Everyone came out to support me, including Hillary. I said that I came to accept the award. If I decided not to leave after, it wouldn't have a positive impact. I went back again. I went back to stay in my home country for two years. After returning to China in 2007, she continued to work tirelessly on her AIDS-related projects. She claimed some international human rights awards and used the prize money to create a small booklet where she wrote about AIDS. She gave it to AIDS patients to spread awareness on prevention and treatment measures. At the same time, a large number of AIDS patients had passed away. There were also a large number of orphans who were infected. She began to spread the word and help the children who had lost their parents. These individuals have suffered discrimination and humiliation from a young age. Failing to show them proper care not only leaves these children in a pitiful state, but also sows the seeds of societal resentment. She said that she saw a child who said there were the words hate and endure inscribed on his body. She asked the child what they wanted to be when they grew up. The child said they wanted to kill people when they grew up. She asked him who exactly. He said the person who drew blood from his father. I think Yao Jiegao is quite remarkable, especially this point. She did not shy away from addressing some of the issues within this marginalized group. For example, she mentioned that some AIDS patients used to prick themselves with needles to create panic and to retaliate against society for the misfortunes they had once experienced. Some individuals have also used their status as HIV patients to extort money and have repeatedly blackmailed others. I think this is quite remarkable because many people in China are engaged in charity work, including many journalists, are certainly aware that AIDS patients are very pitiful and may consciously or even unconsciously avoid mentioning the darker side of their behavior. But when you read the book written by Yao Jiegao, she didn't shy away at all. She was talking about the many scammers she encountered throughout her life. She said that during the HIV prevention process, many people came to find her and promised to create a miracle drug for treating AIDS. But they were all phony, and she ended up in court against them. They all claimed to be volunteering to help AIDS patients. But in reality, they were just in it for personal gain and profit. In her book, there are plenty of such details. So I think she was someone who faced the evil in human nature head on. She did not shy away from exposing the various types of evil that exist within these people just because she felt sympathetic towards them. After returning to her home country, she experienced a series of events that worsened her living conditions. Her purpose in writing these books was to record everything she had experienced. I believe that my time is limited because I am already 85 years old. I am willing to leave the suffering of these people to the world, to future generations. Perhaps someone righteous enough will come along and solve this problem. Being able to leave something behind for future generations is my greatest comfort. I had no other objectives. I felt that these disadvantages advantage groups were too pitiful. No one dared to speak up for them. They were spared no pains. Why did I do all this? Because I felt so sorry for these people. But while she was writing, it was either difficult to publish her work or she encountered a multitude of difficulties in the process of gathering resources. So in 2009, she chose to live in the United States. Columbia University hired her as a visiting scholar. In reality, she used this opportunity to write books. Over the past decade, she has written three books while living in the United States. One is the story of her own fight against AIDS. There is also a book called 10,000 Letters, which consists of letters from AIDS patients across the country. She selected a portion of them and compiled them into a book. She also reorganized a part of her previous autobiography titled Noble Soul. The book has been republished in a revised edition. Yao Jiegao's life in the United States was actually quite tight financially. According to an interview, Yao Jiegao had a monthly income of $600. She lived in a one-bedroom apartment in a high-crime neighborhood in New York and had written her will several years ago. 
she said she did not want a grave after her death. Her ashes are to be taken back to China to be reunited with her late husbands and scattered in the Yellow River. After reviewing the comments from domestic media, the overall tone is quite positive towards her. However, it remains low-key, as the nature of her work does not allow for grand publicity, given the authorities' disapproval. On the other hand, Yao Jigao spent her later years in exile in the United States, where she lived for over a decade. I have always been thinking that, in a certain sense, Yao Gao's work is very similar to ours as journalists. She's just someone who revealed what she saw, but this truthful person wasn't allowed to speak freely in her own country and was forced to leave her homeland. She said she couldn't speak English and she also couldn't understand it. After arriving in the United States, she also found it difficult to adapt to American cuisine. She only ate the simplest kind of bread and tore some pieces off every day for food. Why do those who often speak the truth at critical moments in our country have to leave? The country has changed because of her efforts. Thanks to her efforts, a large part of the community received attention. Thanks to her efforts, society resolved the issues it faced. But even so, you will find that all these whistleblowers, although they ultimately drive social progress, do not receive the respect of society and ultimately have to leave their own country. This is truly the biggest grievance of our time. Because my days on this earth are numbered. No problem! I saw how you were doing today. Do you know that I will be a hundred years old in four years? I know. Scary or not, it's sure scary to think about. I told you, I will not live forever. I will die, but those who are suffering still need more people to know about them. The international community has bestowed well-deserved honor and mourning for Yao Jiegao. The New York Times and BBC both dedicated articles to mourn her after her passing. I saw a comment saying that no one loved their country more than this old lady. I think this statement is very accurate because our love for a country is not only reflected in singing its praises, but more importantly in facing the country's problems and remembering its hardships, recording the experiences of people who have suffered in this country and sharing them can help more people care about value and understand them. This is true love for one's country. So I think Yao Jigao's love for this country was the most sincere form of love there is. I once read a piece written by Yao Jigao two years ago in which she wrote a poem for her own children. Gao Yao was saying that she was a qualified doctor but not a qualified mother. As she was about to leave China for the United States, her son had once bowed on the ground before her, pleading with her not to go to America. He felt that if his mother went to the United States, it would bring him endless troubles at home. The research materials she gathered in the South were once burned by her own husband because he was also afraid. Her daughter eventually fled to Canada and was also quite unforgiving towards her. Soon after arriving in the United States, she received a letter from her daughter who wrote, If you keep pushing yourself so hard, when you face death, you won't have a loved one by your side. I am Chinese. In my 80s I fled abroad, but I had no choice, so I feel like I don't have much time left. I didn't consider anything else. I just think about getting my work done as quickly as possible, while my mind is still clear. In fact, what her daughter said turned out to be true, unfortunately. So when Yao Jiegao finally left this world, she left the world alone. But I think, as she was about to pass away, she must have been thinking about these children. So I would like to end today's show by reciting everyone a poem by Yao Ji Gao. The title of this poem is Longing. My nights are your days. When I am longing for you, you drift off into sleep. The 92-year-old me indefinitely reminisces about your little childhood faces, the calls of your sweet childish voices, and how lively and carefree you acted. This used to be a joyous scene for me. As of late, this scene only exists within my dreams. Asked him to be discharged from the hospital. After being discharged, he said to the nurse, Auntie, please save me. Don't make me leave the hospital. I want to get treatment. He saw the doctor and said, Uncle, please save me. I need to see a doctor. But in the end, the hospital insisted on discharging him. This was the hospital he originally gave blood to. Finally, while his mother held him at home, he passed away at 2 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, while hugging his mother's neck, he said, Mom, please protect me. I don't feel so good. Time, he was 14 years old. He was kneeling down and saying, Dad, Dad, please don't sell the house. I won't get better. I won't ever be cured. 
If you sold the house, our whole family would have nowhere to live. Because my days on this earth are numbered. No problem. I saw how you were doing today. Do you know that I will be a hundred years old in four years? I know. Scary or not, it's sure scary to think about. I told you, I will not live forever. I will die, but those who are suffering still need more people to know about them.